All right, I'm sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, my name is Tyson Slocum, and it is a real honor to be with everyone uh, here tonight. I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm an old friend of New Energy Economy and love the, the work that the organization and all of its supporters uh, do for the people of New Mexico. So I'm the energy program director with a group called Public Citizen in Washington, D.C., and I am uh, focused on uh, uh, the role that liquefied natural gas facilities uh, play in our economy. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to uh, get to this. Okay, so um, uh, I frequently uh, appear before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the U.S. Department of Energy talking about uh, uh, liquefied natural gas uh, facilities. And so what I can tell you about a liquefied natural gas peak shaving facility like this. So first, I, I, do we all already sort of know what liquefied natural gas is? No. No, okay. So gas, natural gas, methane gas in its natural form is a vapor. It's in a gaseous form. Uh, in order to uh, make it more economical to ship overseas or store in a tank, you freeze it to minus 260 degrees to turn it from a vapor into a liquid. And by doing so, you are vastly increasing the density, making it easier to export across oceans or to store economically in a tank, as is this proposal for this uh, peak shaving facility. And I guess the, uh, the proposal here is that by taking some gas out of the pipeline system, liquefying it, uh, and keeping it super cooled, uh, you will be able to store it in that state and then release it into the pipeline system when prices or demand needs require it. This is extremely expensive to keep this gas in its unnatural state of a liquid. And so there are huge costs associated with keeping it super cooled at minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. But also when you are packing that much gas into a liquid form, you are uh, uh, really making it incredibly dense so that if there is some sort of failure with the equipment, you have an enormous quantity of gas uh, in this liquid form that you wouldn't necessarily have with a pipeline system. And so here you can see on the screen, this is literally from a month ago in Louisiana where an LNG tank uh, that was connected to an off-the-grid power plant in an area of rural uh, Louisiana that uh, had lost uh, grid infrastructure after a 2020 hurricane, there was a massive failure in this uh, uh, LNG tank that caused a huge explosion. And because of the compressed nature of the LNG, any time that there is a catastrophic failure of the equipment that results in any sort of release or explosion, you have to evacuate a very large zone. And in this case, they had to evacuate uh, uh, anyone living within a mile uh, radius of this uh, town. So thankfully no one was hurt. In 2014, in almost exactly same uh, LNG peak shaving facility as is being proposed in New Mexico uh, had a massive failure in Washington state that resulted in a catastrophic explosion. No one died, but it did hurt five workers, several seriously. It threw 250 pound uh, 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 pieces of steel 300 yards they had to evacuate everyone within a two mile radius. So again, this Washington state facility, and this is my PowerPoint presentation. I've, I've shared this with uh, New Energy Economy and all of these uh, images here are hyperlinked. So once you have this uh, 
presentation, you can click on the on the on the uh, the graphic here, and it'll take you to the original source material. In this case, a Seattle Times news article, so you can read it uh, for yourselves. And it took about two years to uh, formally investigate the cause of that. And basically, what happened was they there were two. Uh, LNG tanks at this peak shaving facility. You take one out of service for a little bit, you clean it, do some basic maintenance, and then you try to bring it back online. And during the process of trying to bring it back online, it suffered a catastrophic failure. Uh, and, and so that was uh, the cause of the situation. So getting to whether or not this is necessary for New Mexico's natural gas system this is just a graph showing uh, since 1990, monthly New Mexico natural gas residential consumption. And you can see it's been relatively constant and the peaks uh, are very similar to what we saw 25 years ago. And so the point of this graph is just to show you that there isn't a lot of new demand that's coming online. In fact, demand is fairly constant. And so the question is why you need to invest in a hundred million, $180 million peak shaving facility that's not going to be doing much in terms of uh, uh, delivering value for consumers and definitely not for the environment. Um, so both regionally and nationally, natural gas consumption has largely flatlined. So that just means that uh, natural gas demand is not growing. And the national trend is to replace natural gas in homes and businesses by electrifying buildings, which is far more cost effective. And you can pair those buildings with renewable energy uh, deployment like rooftop solar or community solar systems and battery storage where you can uh, replace uh, these gas needs in homes and, and commercial businesses with electricity. Also, the utility can be investing in energy efficiency uh, outside of building electrification. So for $180 million, the utility and, and your state's regulators should be aggressively exploring alternatives to uh, investing in a sort of outdated and highly dangerous uh, LNG peak shaving uh, facility. So I'm, I'll wrap up there and uh, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, happy to move on to other speakers, but thank you very much. Um, how, I know it's a cool to 160 Fahrenheit negative Fahrenheit. So, what, how much electricity would be being used to cool the natural gas? Ah, so the cooling of this unit uses an enormous amount of electricity. Um, and so, I, I'm I'm actually not uh, intimately familiar with. Uh, with exactly what their plan is in this situation. But in order to liquefy the gas, that takes an enormous amount of, uh, of, of energy, typically electricity, because you are transferring a vapor, turning it into a liquid. So you have to uh, uh, liquefy it at minus 260 degrees, and then you have to maintain that temperature in these storage tanks. And just like operating your freezer or refrigerator, that takes energy, but this is a massive amount of energy. So the exact amount, I actually don't know I, because I'm not intimately familiar with the uh, uh, complete uh, specifications of this proposal, but it takes an enormous amount of energy to maintain natural gas in the liquefied state. And so here's another question. Placing this thing anywhere close to a major two lane road is a terrible idea because if there's any issue with this, the standard protocol 
as we've seen in other recent disasters involving LNG peak shaving units, is you have to declare an emergency and what's known as an extraction zone of at least a one mile radius, which means if there is a two lane road within a mile or so of this proposed facility, that road is not gonna be passable while there is a uh, failure or other emergency at this facility. Right, so my, my question is then, so then why is it being done? I mean, if, if the demand pretty much is level, they don't need a new facility like this. That's a that's an excellent point. So the question is, does the utility continue to double down and invest in uh, sort of antiquated technology in an, in a futile attempt to shield consumers from price spikes? Uh, which was the example uh, that I believe that the utility is using from Winter Storm Uri, or do we make a commitment to start to move away from gas, which is going to be a lot less expensive than this $180 million investment? And so that's that's really the question that people should be asking of, of regulators and the utility. Thank you both so much. We, I know there's more questions, and that's definitely where we want to be. I am going to just ask you to take a moment for another person in the room, someone who's very critical and at the crux of helping us better understand where we're at. There was questions about with this conflict, with this issue, where are we? How do we offer a defense and an alternative analysis? And that's exactly what Chris Dodd is here to talk to us a little bit about. Chris, I know that a big part about this case is um, or an issue around this is head price volatility. So can you tell us a little bit about what you've been learning about these issues while incorporating what you've learned from audience? Sure. So let me first introduce myself. My name is Chris Dodd. I'm an attorney. And I'm, I'm working on behalf of the New Energy Economy in the PRC to fight against the LNG facility. Uh, and ultimately, it was quite what can you do? Can I talk about Sure. Um, so, first, I want to talk about why is this being proposed, right? So, Tyson's talked about peak shaving. Um, peak shaving, basically, what you have to understand is. New Mexico Gas Company is basically a distributor of gas. They don't produce gas, they buy it on the market, and they sell it on to their consumers. And um, what that means is, like, who, who here uses gas from New Mexico Gas Company as a home? And you use it primarily to heat your home in the winter, right? Most people are using it for heating. You're not really using it in the summer. And so what that means is the in throughout the year, the price of gas fluctuates. In the summer, it's cheap. In the winter, it's expensive. In the winter months, when you're really cold, where you have a storm, prices spike up in the roof. Okay, and so the idea of peak shaving is that by having gas stored that you pay for it in the summer, you can draw on it in the winter and use it then. Okay, that's the idea of storing gas. They can buy it cheap during the cheap months and then sell it to you all in months where it would be too expensive to go on the market and get it. And so ultimately, ultimately, this is a hedging strategy. And they already do Okay, New Mexico Gas Company contracts with a company called Peter Morgan for storing their gas down in Texas, in West Texas. At a facility called Keystone. And they actually have a contract to store up to, I believe, 1.8 billion cubic feet of natural gas down in the West What they're proposing is to get rid of that entirely and ship solely to this LNG facility, such that this LNG facility would be their only storage, which means they're ultimately almost cutting their storage in half, right? And putting it all here locally. <laughs> they say that it's better to do that because it's going to be local. They can't have disruptions in that getting the gas from Texas. And so let's talk a little bit about 
winter storms. In particular, there have been two major winter storms that have impacted with the natural gas in the past 15 years. The first was in 2011, and the second was in 2021, winter storm three. Um, in 2011, there were significant disruptions in the natural gas uh, supply lines. Ultimately, what that meant is that New Mexico gas company had to curtail its supply of gas to Mario. What was the figure? Was it 5,000 customers? I think something like that. Don't quote me on it. It's somewhere in there. About 5,000 people lost gas for a short period of time because they just didn't have enough gas. Yeah. Since then, there have been incredible improvements in infrastructure. In 2021, winter storm Uriah. Huge winter storm, right? This is the one where you saw the photos of Houston with like pipes burst and like icicles coming down from, from the floors down in uh, Houston. Um, what that storm did was it drove the price of natural gas due to the recall. And there's still some investigation, there's litigation going on about exactly why that happened, right? Because the price went from like three dollars per unit to three hundred dollars per unit overnight. Um, and so what the what happened in 2021 was there was there was issue getting the gas in so the wet. And so New Mexico Gas Company was asked by the PRC to look into how can we avoid those kinds of issues from happening? Because ultimately the New Mexico Gas Company had to go buy that gas in market. Nobody got curtailed in 2020. Everybody had gas, nobody went without heating. But the prices were extremely high. And so in February 2021, the gas company spent about $100 million buying gas in the market. That's about how much they could really spend in the full year, right? Just to give you an idea, like one weekend, one five day, it's a holiday weekend, and spend it out on five days. Um, they spent as much in gas in five days as they did the whole year, right? And so the idea is to prevent following and they say that LNG is the way to do it with the facility here in Rio Rancho. Um, ultimately, however, there's a question of okay, so does it actually solve the problem? Would you save the hundred million dollars? Right? And their answer is no, I shouldn't put it. We'd save about 30% of our cost. Right? So they say they say their estimates say they'd save about 30 million bucks in winter storm here. That also assumes that they stay on budget. There was a recent um, similar facility, it was a smaller facility, but it was built in Arizona. Um, they went over budget by at least 50%, I believe. And so 180 million is what they're proposing right here. Well, you we could be talking an additional 90 million potentially if they have cost overruns, and they always have cost overruns. And so ultimately we're looking at what could be, you know, close to $300 million to save $30 million. Perhaps the answer is not something that would be anything like that, right? You want to diversify. Don't just store gas in one place, store it in a few places, right? Because then if you have trouble getting it out of the stuff, you can get it from somewhere else. That is not what they are intending to do with LNG. With LNG, all the answers are still going back. And it's a gigantic basket here in Rio Rancho. And if there's a fire or something like that, New Mexico Gas Company has no store gas anywhere else. Now, what we found is there's another facility that they could be that is that already exists. It's called Grammar Bridge. It's owned by a company called uh, N Store, which is a big company. Um, and it's down in northeastern New Mexico, or south of New Mexico. And it's a depleted field. Basically, it's just a, a field that doesn't produce petroleum anymore, and they can pump natural gas in there. And Ensport is making it available to store um, natural gas. Um, we don't know exactly why they're not close to the that. What we're suggesting is perhaps what we should do is use that facility in addition to the facility, right? So you have two facilities there. That way, you have redundancy. And if you have redundancy, you have resiliency, which means you can avoid enormous spikes in price when there are issues. 
And that doesn't just, that one is not text. You don't have the text problem of being on their grades. What other questions go there? Isn't it true that they want this plant because they'll own it? And that means they get to charge us interest on it and make the money off of it, basically? Yeah, so let me explain kind of how this works in the case. Okay? What they want to do is they're asking the PRC for authorization to spend $180 million of their money to build this facility. But they're regulating the right? They want to get that money back. They're going to get a return on their investment. And so what that means is they get to bill to their customers, all of you, additional money, and they get to make a return on it. And so basically what the way it works out is every year they get almost 10% of their investment paid back to them by all of you as a profit on their investment, right? Nine point something percent. Um, and so you know, I'm I am not a lawyer, I'm not very good at that. Um, but the first year you're talking 18 million bucks, right? That's what they say on the budget. They run over and they get it right. Um, and they get that every single year until the thing's basically been paid off, right? I think right now it's close to 30 year depreciation sales. So 30 years, the next way they're going to be paying this. They say it's about three bucks per month. Per customer, per month. Yeah. 30 years. Mm -hmm. right. It's not a small amount of money. I think I'm saying. No, the really expensive. They're going to charge them interest, and when something happens, they can take out a whole city block. I don't. Not a whole city block. They could. They could take out all of West Elm Street. I mean, no, I'm. That's not. Yes, sir. My understanding is that 2013, they tried the same thing. And it's really uh, gathered together to prevent it. So it just seems to me they're just trying to, every few years, jam this thing in. So if we start using the strategy we did back then, it probably work. Yeah, yeah. So this was the little form of the board. And they ran into a great wall of resistance. They were like, okay, never mind. Never mind. Nobody wants to get on board with us this problem. Uh, there is going to be a resistance this time around. Okay, new energy economy is is a boat there. Um, Western Reserve uh, applicants is a um, It looks like probably the Attorney General's office will oppose. Um, and for one other Mario, coalition for the affordable. Coalition for the affordable. Ultimately, they say there are two things that you get with this facility. You get reliability, meaning nobody's gas has to cut off, and you get prices to go down. Right? Those are the two things that they say that you get. Well, reliability, you don't think you have. Not anymore, because it's already reliable. 2021, yes, the gas prices went up, but gas will go to the bed. Like they didn't have to first fail anybody's gas. So the money that we don't need is one of the Really what it's not about. And and you don't know exactly how much it's going to say. So there has to say the range is going here again. Which is the worst we can possibly that in the price in the in the natural range, right? It's fighting three to three hundred over a night. You'd say it very much. Yes, well, I'm just wondering about this reliability and the enormous electricity power needs because I live in Rio Rancho and in the last two weeks, 5,000 um, customers live without power. And now tonight, two weeks, maybe even two weeks later, another 3,000 without power. So, you know, how, well, how are we going to pay for that? And how does that factor into this as well? Right. So, we don't really know the reliable from a reliability standpoint. What what kind of issues are introduced when you have your own little facility, right? Like 
This would be New Mexico gas would be run from this thing. And what happens if something goes wrong? You don't have a key right? And what if you have a power? What happens? It's a great question. I don't know. Right? That's why we have experts who can tell me, look, here's what goes on. Right? There are generators, this, or that. I just don't. Know. And I'm wondering how we're going to end up paying for that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. well, um, the proposal, which was. Number of one two, it uh, said that if the gas is going to be transported by the cross, it just could be a lot in and of itself. Well, that's traffic. So, I don't, so, so what I will say is, um, I know one of the reasons that they're saying we go over here, they're right, it's going to be a pipeline. And we need green gas in the It says probably simple. It says they have to build pipes, right? And then they're going to yeah. build okay. pipes. And that's, that's not going to deal with the And if anybody in that slipper around knows the word Rondike, where their trucks used to be on tip over when they could curve that. I'm just saying. <laughs> Two more questions, and then we're done. Yes, sir. I'm just curious. They don't rancho land, is it a private landowner? It's the land lease. How is this happening on that article of land? New Mexico gas is the only Oh, ah, yeah. And then we can build this thing on our And then what kind of tax credit that we can get from their land? That I'm not sure. It'll generate, I mean, I think we're guessing it's somewhere around 8,000. No. Yeah, I think no. Right. These are not these are like data centers, right? Like big data centers get built, and it's like okay, you get a good number of jobs right in the building, but then you only need a couple of run. Same thing with technology. It's like it's just a place where you'll have a few people just watching it, trying to make sure nothing bad happens. But one more question. But well, that's very important because I've seen on their website they said three to eight people. How many of those people are going to firefight? How many of those people are going to security? I mean, that's the big problem because if there's an issue there, they don't have to get people to deal with it. Right. You go get the uh, uh, fire department from uh, Albuquerque running up to uh, a massive fire. Right, right. One more question. Yeah, yeah. did um, uh, did great hairs do that? Uh... New Mexico gas, uh, pay more the land, but it's very important. And when also the answer to that, really don't know. Why are those questions? I don't know. Um, that's something I'll look into, but I'm not sure. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to close out. We need the, the meeting space will be um, we'll wrapping up here soon, but we want to make that was actually the last thing we wanted to talk about. You know, some folks asked, where are we in point in time? What did this talk like? What did this case? So Chris can tell us um, before we close down, where are we in the procedure? And Chris, before you do that, there's on the Zoom, people are wanting to just have clarity about the PRC's role. So if you could actually like back up a second and just make sure to, to clarify that they are the arbiters on this, um, because folks are kind of confused on the sure. Zoom. Yep. So, so this case is currently before the PRC. What that means is New Mexico Gas Company wants to spend all of this money and in charge of the rate change. They have to get approval from the PRC. The PRC has to say, yes, this makes sense. It will produce a different amount of benefit in light of the cost. And therefore, we will do it. Okay? In order for them to figure out whether that's the case, they initiate the proceeding. That can be done. And so a hearing examiner is sort of is going to be in charge of hearing the evidence and then issuing a recommendation to the PRC. And then the PRC will make a determination as to what they think. And there are three PRC members currently, um, based on the new constitutional amendment that is now in the from the governor, and they will decide the case. So let me tell you kind of what the time frame is. So expert testimony is going to be filed on September 11th of 2023, right? Quite soon. Public comment will be on October 23rd of 2023 with three minutes per meter by Zoom. 
and it is incredibly important for members of the community, especially members of the community that are in an area of the to provide that public. Um, the proceedings before the hearing together, meaning like the trial, we basically, um, will begin on October 24th of 2023. And then about a month after that is completed, um, the governor will issue his recommendation. The PRC then receive that, the Supreme Court needs to see that. And then they typically take about another month to make a decision. And in that pending time, it's important for them to hear from members of the public at all of their public hearings. Hey, that issue that you guys are, on, they are considering, you need to really consider it. Here's why. Right? Like that's the time when members of the public can really have their voice heard, is when and then you to hear so that's kind of the time frame. Really, what that means is we're looking at um, a final decision at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Right. And it'll be issued by the PRC three member. Sure. So, September 11th, 2023, is the expert testimony is going to be live. October 23rd is public comment by Zoom. October 24th is the proceeding before the hearing examiner again. And then about a month later, the hearing examiner will like to issue recommendation. And then about a month after that, probably is what I thought the PRC will decide. Here's my question. What can we do in terms of what can public officials, we have two public officials here in the state legislature. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's uh, people on city council, like mayor, there's people on city council and mayor down there. There's other representatives, state senators and commissioners. What would you want them to do? Let me hand it off. Let me hand it off. I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. I thank you for your patience. My name is Marianne Matthew. I'm the executive director of New Energy Economy. So, this is the most important part, really, um, because you don't need to know every single detail. That's our job, and that's the job of the experts that we're going to have um, at, at the, at the hearing. What's really important there are a couple of things. So one is public comment that that goes that talk about, and that is if you speak up from your heart about why you think that this plant um, that they're proposing is not worth the risk, right? I mean, I'll just ask you: Should we be spending 180 million dollars if it was that number to save 30 million dollars? That doesn't make sense, right? It just doesn't make sense especially given the risk of an, um, a conflagration, right? Maybe it won't happen. Of course, I hope it won't happen. But if it does, I mean, just last month, we saw a, 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 in Vermont, a fire truck just with a couple of little sparks, boom, a huge explosion. Luckily, somebody who saw the spark told the driver of the truck, hey, there's sparks under your truck. And literally, his life was saved in within seconds. And if this were to happen at a place like here, it could be a low, a cloud, a vapor cloud that moves at a slow speed until it hits something that ignites it. And then, boom! We don't know how you know what kind of um, conflagration or you know, inferno would happen. They said, you heard, uh, if you go onto New Energy Economy's um, website, you can see the Vermont flame that just went boom like this. And they said they were standing 100 feet away and they could feel the burn, like the, the heat. It was so, it was so hot. So this is something that we're really afraid of. It's not only about money, right? It can't only be about money. It's about, is the risk worth it? And that's the, that's the point that you wanna talk to PRC about, right? We have solutions right now, and of course, one of them is to change our behavior away from so much dependence on gas and to move to renewables and storage, right? That's, and we got the sun here, maybe, right? So, 
that's that's something very important. The other thing is, is that so in addition to giving public comment before the hearing examiner and then before the commission itself, and you know now that you signed up, we will send you information about when all these dates are happening in real time, especially because things change. But the other thing is that there are some representatives here and online, and what we're asking them to do is for them to speak out on our behalf, right? They're called representatives, right? For a reason, they're supposed to represent our interests and the risks that, um, that, that we are afraid might happen. So this is, <coughs> this is another thing. Op-eds, don't underestimate that. That makes a difference. People read them. That will, if, you know, you can take this fact sheet that we have, there's plenty, again, more on our website about it, and you can see the history of LNG accidents. I just want you to know, if you want to see something scary, the largest fire in Ohio's history happened when a Cleveland LNG facility blew up. It was the largest fire in Ohio history. 170 people died, and there was, just enormous. I mean, if you if you start to research, you find out how scary this is. It's about people's lives. It's about people's property. It's about hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars in property damage. So these are all the risks that we're taking, and we don't have to take this risk. We just don't have to take it. This is not, as you know, Tyson so eloquently said in the beginning of this, it, it's not cost effective. There are alternatives. And, um, and we don't want the, this kind of risk. So those are the three major points, right? It's not cost effective, we don't want the risk, and there are alternatives. That's really important. And so we will be in touch with you, and, um, and speaking out is, a, uh, is a sometimes scary, but it's also fulfilling. Like, hey, I love, I love my neighborhood, I love my family, I love, what do you love? And you speak out because you want to protect the, what you love. And so if you go with that kind of message to the PRC, they will hear you. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that your voice is represented because we can't do it without you. That's all there is to say, you know? Written public comment if yes. you're really afraid of public speaking. Yeah, you can, you can write something and, and um, we'll tell you the name of the case. I'll tell you if you want to know, it's 22. Zero zero three oh nine. Sorry, I think that's right. Um, but anyway, um, if it's not, we'll let you know in the in the, um, the emails we sent you. So you can you can write a public comment, and, but we'll we'll give you a link if you can write whatever you want so that it comes really from you. Um, so thank you very much for coming. It's really important that you speak out. If you speak out. You can run.